Serge Bilonji er professor på DIKU, hvor han leder det nyetablerede pionercenter for kunstig intelligens. Serge Bilonji er kommet til DIKU fra Universitetet Cornell Tech, hvor han var professor og prodekan. Pionercenteret for kunstig intelligens består af forskere fra Aalborg Universitet, Aarhus Universitet, Danmarks Tekniske Universitet, IT-Universitetet og Københavns Universitet. Med en finansiering på godt 350 millioner kroner fra Danmarks Grundforskningsfond, Carlsbergfondet, Nove Nordisk Fonden, Lundbækfonden og Vilumfonden skal centret bedrive verdensklasse forskning i kunstig intelligens med fokus på samfundsudfordringer, mennesker og design og bringe Danmark helt i front internationalt. I dag vil Serge Bilonji tage os med på en rejse gennem sit arbejde for at forstå, hvordan mennesker og maskiner kan samarbejde for at forbedre vores forståelse af verden omkring os. Tag godt imod Serge Bilonji. Wouldn't it be cool if we could recognize the species of a bird from a photo? Bird flies by, you take a picture, recognize the species. This is a question I asked my group about 10 years ago or so. Now, you heard in uh, Henrik's speech uh, a little bit about the Pioneer Center. So you know where we are roughly today. But I want to take us back about a decade to just give you some insight into the journey that I've taken through AI in this kind of emerging socio-technical landscape that has been taking shape and tell you a little bit about some of the difficult lessons that I've learned, sometimes awkward, very interesting lessons about AI. And the idea there is just to give you some insight into the worldview that I want to bring to this Pioneer Center. So there was a technical reason for that question about recognizing birds. At the time, now mind you, for those of you who know about the history of AI, this was before the deep learning revolution. All right, this is around 2008, 2009. And uh, we just thought birds were interesting objects. We wanted to recognize them. And a lot of the AI efforts that were taking shape with big data were data sets of so-called coarse-grained categories. These are things like bicycle versus cat. And uh, that's interesting to computer science researchers But it is not really a hit at the family reunion. If you're explaining what your machine does, you feed in a million images and it can tell you cat versus bicycle. So what we wanted was something that could tell you something you didn't already know. Okay, And that could be a bird species. It could also be whether a, a tumor cell is cancerous. Okay, There's a whole bunch of these so-called fine-grained categories. So uh, we started into this project, which we called Visipedia. And Visipedia aimed to capture and share visual expertise. So uh, as we started on this project, like many computer scientists do, it did not occur to us to talk to the experts in that area. Okay? We thought it's completely natural to just write a script and find some website that does bird Uh, some kind of field guide and just scrape the data. And so we did that. Okay, so we found 200 species of birds and uh, we scraped the data, grabbed the images, and trained this classifier. And we called that data set Cub 200, Caltech UCSD Birds 200. And we were pretty proud of ourselves and, and we trained that thing. And keep in mind, this was before the deep learning revolution, which hit around uh, 2012. And the system didn't work that well, but it worked okay. And we kind of took that on the road, started giving talks. And at some point, we reached out to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which is kind of the high church of bird research in the world, at least in North America. And uh, at some point, uh, they invited us out there. And the way that they approached me about this was they said, um, Your data set stinks, all right? It's basically garbage. How did you get these images? And I hung my head in shame. You know, we, we wrote a script and, you know, we went to this site and we, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and they said, well, we like what you're doing, but you need to take the data set curation part seriously. You need to sit with birders, amateurs, 
who, who go out and, and watch birds, uh, citizen scientists, ornithologists, work with us and we'll make a real data set. And that ended up becoming what's called NA Birds, um, the NA, NA Birds 500. Now, those of you who are in AI research also know, <laughs> despite all our attempts to push the good data set, that old crappy one is still the one that's cited all the time. Um, we can't control that type of thing. But the people who are serious about biodiversity research know about the, the good data set. But you know, another thing that popped up in that process was it was very fashionable at the time within machine learning to talk about robustness to mislabeled data. So we wanted to show that we could have these images of birds that had um, the wrong label in the training data and say the system still works, still works well. And that was another little surprise that happened, which was that the people who were trying out the beta version of this bird recognition app, which we call Merlin, they were as interested in the browsing feature as they were in the AI-based identification. So they actually enjoyed just flipping through the pictures of the birds and looking at the labels. Well, that made me sweat too. Why? <laughs> because a lot of the labels were wrong. So when they would flip through and see something wrong, <laughs> imagine I then tell them, don't you worry about that because our system is robust to errors in the training data. And they said, well, that's not how it works because we're not really impressed by your AI gizmo. We also want to browse and, and it, we need the conviction that what you're doing actually makes sense is an, and is on a firm foundation. And so that was another reminder about the importance of, of curation and respect for that community. We eventually brought this uh, to a broader uh, biodiversity stage by working with uh, iNaturalist out of uh, the California Academy of Sciences. And uh, they had heard about Merlin and they wanted to bring this kind of functionality to tens of thousands of species of plants and animals and fungi. And so we did the same kind of engagement with them. And this time we thought we knew what we were doing. Okay, we'd sort of been humbled by this process. And um, so we sent a couple PhD students to the Cal Academy and they worked on putting in this functionality. And then we stepped in it again because uh, the, this app, iNaturalist, it was thriving without AI. It was a very um, productive and um, engaging social network of citizen scientists who like to take pictures and of of biodiversity and discuss it and share and, and talk about the species and, and share it with people who are ex have different levels of expertise. So we put in this, this AI-based system for categorizing species and the button that we added to the app said identify species. It seemed kind of innocuous. And then came the angry email <laughs> from the iNaturalist team where they say, no, 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 you do not identify the species. We identify the species. The iNaturalist community identifies the species. You can suggest the species. You can say this is visually similar. You can say it was seen nearby, but we identify the species. We put it onto our social network. We notify the people who are knowledgeable in that taxonomic group, and they put the label on that exemplar, which then becomes a research grade record. Okay, so that was another humbling moment. And that next step actually brought me to Copenhagen because I started to wonder, what are these research grade records that they're talking about? Where do those go? When something circulates on iNaturalist and elevates to this level of research grade, do they publish it? Where does it go? It turns out it goes to a place called the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, GBIF. And it turns out this is located basically next door to DECU. So I got to know some people at GBIF and unbeknownst to me, I was walking across the park from my future employer. Um, and so I got to know them and they're, they're a global registry of biodiversity data. 
So groups like the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, iNaturalist, and thousands of other museums uh, and citizen science efforts push their occurrence data to GBIF. So uh, GBIF warehouses this data and handles it in a socially responsible manner. They keep track of attribution and provenance. They associate DOIs, digital object identifiers, with all the records. So if you want to do some research on an endangered species in some geo rectangle in the world, you don't have to go to a thousand different agencies to get that data. You can go to GBIF, draw the rectangle, and pull up the relevant records. So I thought that was pretty exciting. Um, and it also represents an opportunity to collaborate with a uh, responsible mediator. It's kind of a mediated AI workflow where the people in GBIF who are mostly database scientists can work between the taxonomy community and computer science researchers and ensure that we don't make those dumb mistakes all the time. We're still gonna make dumb mistakes, but they'll help us make fewer. So um, that somewhat directly led to me discovering about, discovering the Pioneer Center opportunity. Uh, that and having a Danish spouse, uh, which was also a factor. But um, through those trips to, to Denmark and getting to know the researchers, I realized this engagement with GBIF was not an accident. That type, that role that GBIF plays of a kind of responsible mediator for large amounts of data is actually emblematic of a role that this region of the world can play. If the US and China emerge as the superpowers in AI, does that mean there's nothing for us to do? Absolutely not. Of course, there's still a role for Europe and Scandinavia in particular. So I feel a sense of inspiration when I look at what GBIF did and I think about the other types of global registries that we could have, that we could cultivate within Denmark that could help fight the spread of misinformation online or databases of tissue pathology and other things like that for which you need trust in institutions and you need a reputation on the world stage that shows that there's respect for data, for attribution, for provenance. So this is something that has inspired me in terms of starting this Pioneer Center. Finally, I want to point out that the Pioneer Center does not exist in a vacuum. As Henrik said, it is the result of a very large grant, so it's certainly not something small, but it sits alongside other very important efforts that are linking different universities and computer science departments across Denmark. DIRECT, ADD, Algorithms, Data, and Democracy, DDSA, Danish Data Science Academy, uh, so these efforts working together, these are opportunities to raise Denmark's profile on the world stage for AI research. Now, wearing the hat as DQ faculty, of course, I'm going to tell you it's the first, it's the best. Okay, we can say that internally. Okay, I'm on team DQ. But on the international stage, if I bump into people at conferences and they say, um, DQ, DTU, is that the same thing? I, I'm not going to say yes, it's the same thing, but I'll smile and I'll go along with it. And I'll say, you know, it isn't the same, but we all work together. And if you want to study AI or you want to pursue digitalization in a socially responsible way, just come to Denmark. All right, that's the first thing. Just come to Denmark, and you may not know the difference between aau.dk and au.tk. That's okay. We're going to figure that out. <laughs> Just come to Direct or BDSA or ADD or Pioneer Center, and we'll get you pointed in the right direction. Okay. And the last thing I just want to say is thank you, because I feel like I've I've been welcomed as a member of this family. I mean, this is 50 years. This is a really distinguished university. And you've made me feel like uh, a member of this family. So I just want to express my gratitude for that. So thank you.